Good evening. There has to be a cl technical glitch. Um, I have the honor of this esteemed panel. I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do a good justice to this panel discussion. But it, after Elmo, is going to be really difficult to match up to uh, Elmo's uh, delivery and energy and uh, charm. But we are no less. I've had a great uh, discussion with uh, panel members, all of whom are corporate giants have years of experience in the CSR space. And uh, while our topic is uh, STEM, I want to start with a quick read of the room to get a sense of who we are so that accordingly I can moderate the session to work best for you. So how many from NGOs? Okay. How many from uh, uh, science uh, equipment vendors or? Okay. Vendors, service providers. How many from companies? Okay. So thank you so much. That gives me a general sense of where, where, what to lead to. I definitely do not need to speak about the importance of STEM, um, because that's 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 just known to all of us. But I'll just highlight on a couple of things on STEM. I don't know if you knew this, but India contributes 31.7 percent of all the STEM graduates in the whole world. And that's also a function of our demographics. Uh, we, our population itself brings it, but that's incredible figures. Um, the National Science Foundation estimates that 80% of all jobs in the next decade will have some basis or, or requirement of math and science skills. That's where the future is going to evolve. There's been a 44% increase in the STEM job postings in the, over the past two years. So that's clearly a sector, a place where from a livelihood perspective, there's a huge amount of opportunities. But in India, it's not that it is not known to us. All children know or want or aspire, but there are certain anomalies in our STEM education. So, so globally, by and large, there are five systemic issues when it comes to STEM education. The first is the fundamental skill gap. STEM, like you all know, all, st all STEM subjects cannot be our foundational layering, right? You have to have the formulas, you, have to, you can only build on what your foundation has been. And if you skip it or a grade eight, if you haven't got the foundation, it's very hard to go back and, and acquire those skills. Then there's the belief gap, which is the general belief that science is too tough or difficult or this, this is a subject which is too difficult for, is not for me or I'm from a rural background. Then there's a curious phenomenon, which is the post-secondary gap which is um, a curious drop in the number of people who, children who take up science and the post-secondary phase. The cutoff marks that are required in the science, good science colleges is extremely high. So, and as a career option, and then there's a huge lack of children opting for research. The fourth one is the geography gap, which is easy to understand, which is urban versus rural, not just in the education space, but also in the job space as to where, do, where are all the STEM jobs, they're in the uh, urban space. And finally, the demographic gap, the curious case of girls. Um, girls are actually better at science subjects. Sorry, Elmo's bag is left behind. Uh, the girls are really good at science and from age 11 to 15, girls actually excel and, and are better at science. But there's, at age 15, something strange happens. Um, there's a drop in, in girls taking up science subjects. But even then in India it's not as bad. But the sheer crazy drop happens in the job, uh, the transition from school to, to work, where girls do not, uh, are not represented enough in, in skill uh, subjects. Well, that's about me and the context that I had uh, to give. Because frankly, I don't need to preach to the choir. All of you are uh, very much aware of this. So in my panel, I have people who have dedicated their CSR careers in this space, have a great understanding. One, one key thing that I want us to be able to take out is that they are from a vantage position. If you are CSR head of a company with sizable outlays, all of us would have approached them one point or the other with our models, with our approach, with our initiatives and, and why ours works. And they had the, the difficult choice to choose a path. So my question to all my panel members to start and begin with is, 
is to explain the rationale and approach behind their initiatives in STEM. How did they choose it? Why do they believe in what the initiatives that they want to do as a, as a company? Which aspects do they uh, focus on and why? So to begin with, I will begin with uh, Vijay. Um, a fun fact about Vijay. Vijay has an identical twin. And they have studied together, they have the similar marks, they went to the same uh, college and they are both in CSR. So we are not entirely sure whether we got Vijay or his brother. <laughs> But it's uh, me. I you, have my Aadhaar card by the way. Oh, okay. And, and when you speak about synopsis, so we'll know sure. if you got the original or not. So <laughs> Thanks, thanks, George. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm representing uh, synopsis, and uh, synopsis is basically into uh, semiconductor business. And uh, when I say semiconductor, it, uh, it is very obvious that it requires a lot of engineering. Uh, this is the, uh, mm, the rationale behind uh, choosing STEM as one of our focus areas under education was because our business is linked with uh, engineering. We wanted to instill the interest in science and spark the curiosity in the rural kids uh, with respect to science and technology. So yeah, that's the rationale behind our uh, selection. So thanks. All the initiatives as well. That you oh, so uh, for our initiatives, uh, we are uh, primarily focusing on uh, education. Uh, environment, community and under education we are focusing on STEM where we uh, have uh, iMobiles, uh, then we have um, uh, science festivals wherein we uh, engage rural kids with the uh, science graduates or maybe the students who are still pursuing uh, engineering in science colleges. It's a very huge festival and the outcome is re really fantastic and it's a lot of, uh, it's a great exposure for the rural kids actually. So these are the two uh, initiatives and we also have initiatives wherein uh, we uh, reach out to uh, the government schools and form clusters in, uh, basically it's in Bangalore where we, we form clusters and then we teach the uh, basics of STEM. So these are a couple of initiatives that are focused on uh, STEM education. Thanks. Also speak about the Raman. Uh, Raman clubs. Oh, yeah. So uh, Raman clubs is basically uh, an initiative taken by us to uh, instill the idea of basics of STEM. So we take we, ha we actually have piloted 50 schools in Bangalore. And what we do is we form clubs after getting to know the interest level of certain students. It's not that all the students will have to participate. It's level one, we talk about their interest level. After we gauge the interest level, then we finalize and form certain clubs. And a part of the club is the teachers, school teachers. We provide them training so that they can conduct STEM related experiments and classes and sessions for these clubs and after a certain point of time, maybe three years, we conduct uh, events or kind of um, mm, what do you call uh, something like uh, competition uh, within different clubs. So, so each club represents one school. So there's a sense of competition and there is a uh, encouragement and motivation for the students as well. So this is how we operate for the uh, Raman clubs in Bangalore. Thank you, Vijay. In order to just break symmetry, uh, I'll just jump to you, Seema. So. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Pratima, yeah. So I represent Lenovo India uh, Private Limited. I look at CSR and philanthropy for Asia Pacific. Uh, smarter technology for all is the brand promise for Lenovo. Just and one minute. Is she audible at the back, Nona? Okay, is this better? Yeah, yeah okay, much better. Thanks. So, uh, smarter technology for all is the brand promise for Lenovo and within that, our corporate uh, philanthropy and CSR mission is um, access to technology for the underserved and STEM education. Within this, our CSR portfolio focuses more on uh, STEM education for uh, kindergarten to grade 12 and also on uh, STEM careers for youth. Uh, basis this strategy, we've been working with Meghshala Trust, uh, which focuses on capacity building of the teachers. Uh, the fundamental here is to say that if you want to build the STEM mindsets in students, you first need to build that with the teachers. And that is why uh, the Meghshala app, which is a free application that provides 
uh, STEM content to teachers as well as students is something that we have been supporting for the last four years. Uh, we worked with Meghshala in the Northeast, in Meghalaya, Manipur and Sikkim and we are also taking this program forward in Karnataka. The second program that we are working on is also Agastya, similar to what Bijay spoke to you about. We support a science center in Bangalore and we have uh, three iMobile vans uh, that look at building experiential learning in slum communities with students from uh, government and municipal schools. And the third program, um, and this is interesting because we were at one point of time brought in the Made in India product development and when we did that, we realized that there were not enough women in the uh, manufacturing sector, specifically in the area of assembling. And uh, we work with TNS India Foundation in building a campus to corporate program that focuses specifically on women from ITI colleges and uh, we provide them internships uh, to take forward again the classroom learn learning into internships which actually act as learning rooms which is the appropriate title to this panel. Uh, George, that's it from me. Thank you. And Pratima is a fairly an awe-inspiring figure. 20 years in the space, she's seen it all, the evolution of CSR, how and or different kinds of models, nothing surprises her. So I'm hoping we will uh, be able to tap into a little bit more of your experiences and understanding of models that work and don't work and uh, the challenges as well. Over to you, Seema. Seema is from SKF. Yeah. So, uh, I'll just uh, talk about the rationale why we uh, went for STEM. So, uh, there's a small story uh, to start a STEM project. Uh, you know, it's, it's really difficult uh, for a CSR, you know, when you represent a CSR to a board. So, we really have to make a combination how it is linked with business. So, in 2016, uh, we started a uh, SKF scholarship program for girls. Uh, this program was supporting the higher education after 10th grade till graduation. Uh, so, we realized the girls after their 12th exam, HSC exam, they are not able to score good marks in competitive exam, mostly in CET and NEET. Then we did a little impact assessment, understand what is, why this is happening. We realize that the girls score less because they don't, you know, the basic science concepts are not clear. Mostly in, in government school, the girls coming from the government school or from the rural uh, part of India. Uh, so where the science is basically teach through chalk and, you know, board method is used. And that's how we thought of, you know, starting a STEM project in schools so that, you know, we, we actually go and, you know, give the exp uh, experience, I mean, learning methods of, uh, for the student. Secondly, uh, we are, uh, SKF is a bearing company, we produce bearing and we are basically a mechanical engineering company where uh, our shop floor, we have only 7 to 10 percent of females uh, in or women in, on our shop floor and we see there is a lot of need of, you know, having a female employees or female staff over there. So again, connecting back to STEM because if you see all our childhood, basically girls are normally taught to play with toys like you, uh, we know that and for the boys it's car so it's it never for a girl you know to get into mechanical is something which she is she is not in that specific aptitude so that's the reason why again it connects to our business and you know that's the that's how the stem get connected and you know we want to increase the number of female employees in manufacturing setup thirdly it is also linked with our one of our initiative we have our third one more initiative in skilling where we support automobile sector so where we train the mechanics and again it is linked with stem and very importantly my board understands stem because they all are from the engineering background so when i take a proposal to board they really understand it they linked it and i you know then the things move more faster and i also get the inputs so I think this is the rationale how we have, you know, built the STEM project and we were successfully able to, you know, uh, take an approval from the board and today we are able to reach to more than 20,000 uh, students through our STEM learning uh, and, you know, uh, able to make an impact in uh, almost more than 50 schools uh, across seven locations. So that's the rationale behind how we started the STEM project. 
Thank you, Seema. And she brings out a very important point. I don't know if you caught it or not. In that, when we typically think of STEM, we think of STEM in schools. Um, we forget that even skilling programs for technicians, mechanical uh, engineers, or ITIs, that's also STEM. Uh, it's just that if you've missed out the boat in your education system, that's not the end of your STEM career. And those skilling programs that exist to, to uh, fulfill these very much fall under STEM education as well. One usually over overlooked area. So next I have uh, Joyta from IBM. Now when I say IBM itself and the global legacy of work that they have in STEM uh, and the philosophy, the amount, the scale at which she will be talking will be a little um, inspiring. Uh, that's polite. <laughs> it's just shocking. But, but yeah, over to you, Joyta. The rationale, the approach and uh, your initiatives that you will take. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I think I should just want, you know, I want to begin by saying that Sonali, thank you for taking us back to a happy place, Gali Gali Sim Sim, you know, all those lovely things and some of the STEM resources which we've stopped probably using, uh, we should go back to that. But going back to IBM, yes, it's an organization which is 111 years, which is celebrated 111 years. So it's gone through different waves of transformation, change, seen ups and downs, have seen a female CEO and whatnot, right? Um, so the rationale I think George has already addressed, you know, you've given some great statistics there. And that's something that every one of us, every organization, um, you know, started thinking about when the Company Act came into being uh, in consultation with a lot of not-for-profit partners and government partners. So uh, IBM's investment in education and skilling is almost 95% of the total spent. And to, to kind of justify that, we had to come up with a huge program in alignment with a national priority of the country, company's priority, which you said, this business. If there is good business, then there is CSR. We all know that. And which is why we designed a huge flagship program, uh, in, you know, three years back, four years back now, uh, which is called STEM for Girls in India. And uh, the design was out of school. You know, there was no in-school curriculum because that would take forever. We started partnering with 13 state governments uh, that, are, that are there with us and collaborating them, bringing the students and girls, bringing their parents, creating that awareness through workshops, starting with hackathons, involving our mentors and volunteers to do that mentoring, bring them up and then probably kind of have a healthy competition, have some scholarships around that. And we designed this over the last few years. Uh, it has come to a stage where we think that, like you said, you know, we started thinking that how can we connect that vocation, interest to a profession, right? And that vocation landing into a profession is, that's what we started partnering with a couple of other key initiatives uh, like the Atal Tinkering Labs, when the government set out to do that, uh, we did support and create their platform. Uh, you know, Mentor of Change is a platform powered by IBM so that, you know, we have an ecosystem. So we are good in creating ecosystems. We are good in creating clusters, enabling them, you know, bringing uh, all the stakeholders together because I think that's something that a program has done, not only just in classroom, but also in um, out of classroom. A great example of in classroom for STEM is, um, you know, f is creating a curriculum framework on artificial intelligence and integrating that in school for CBSC that they adopted that as their elective subject and introduced that in grade 11 and 12. So that's like a great example of integrating something like an artificial intelligence. Then we worked with Ministry of Skill and we revamped their age-old ICT curriculum into a two-year curriculum on 
IT networking and cloud computing. We designed a five months paid internship at IBM and possibly, you know, uh, landing into jobs, going through the same rigor as any other institution would go through. So these are some of the initiatives that we've done and none of this in, is done in isolation, all aligning with national priorities and companies' priorities. And of course, that is tech for good or whatever that is, but it is, you know, I don't know about any other ha hashtag, but yeah, it is for getting that social impact um, together, creating that co-creation of different models. Fascinating. I did say she's the scale at which they operate and the casually working with state governments, which is a, a ceiling most of us still struggle to crack. But if you've seen from my panel members, there is experience at every level of STEM interventions um, at the grassroots level, at, at the access level, fundamental level, geography level, skilling perspective, state uh, collaborations, different models that they have experimented and done, worked with. But I want to take a read of the room again uh, so, so that I can direct. You know the expertise now, you know the exposure, you know what they're, um, they, they, they would be able to talk about, just about everything in the, in the space. So I'm giving three options. You can only raise your hand once, um, uh, so then I can direct the conversation in that. The one, one way we could go is, you don't have to raise it right now, cost-efficient ways to achieve equity, which is the divide between rural, uh, urban facilities, there is equipment, uh, science, uh, STEM equipment is expensive, access is difficult, there's usually one equipment for multiple uh, students uh, to access, the other is, they work with partners as well, right? Uh, so which models or organizations or approaches have they encountered and seen which they believe has the greatest impact? Uh, it's a, it's in, in a way of sharing so that you, you can study them, those models as well. And the third way we could go is the pain points and the challenges that they see from their position, they are, they are at a vantage position. Um, and if there, and there, there are solutions that they wish existed. Okay, so I'm going to ask, so those three options, you raise your hand only once for any of these three. So how many for the cost efficient ways to achieve equity? Very few. The models, organization approaches that they believe has greatest impact. Okay, thank you. And the pain points, challenges they as CSR heads uh, see and encounter and they wish they had solutions for. Okay, thank you. So I think we are going to go with the, the first one and if you time permits, they've removed the timer so I don't know how I'm doing on time. <laughs> no, there are more. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll go with uh, what models, organizations, approaches that you believe. And I'll start with you. Uh, one organization that is common uh, is Agastya uh, Foundation that uh, three of us have worked with. So uh, clearly that's one and if there are other organizations, approaches or thinking. So there's one more thing I want to highlight when we are speaking about this. Is that, you know, typically when we say STEM interventions, we look at the foundational level, which is making science exciting, fun through experimentation or models. But it gets more and more progressively difficult, right? The calculus comes in, algebra comes in, all the science uh, subjects become highly complicated. And then that's the fun part becomes a little more diluted. So maintaining that tempo that you can, you can get from getting children to interact with models and learning fundamental uh, concepts, how does that? So Pratima, we'll start with you. Uh, your thoughts on what the models, organizations, approaches, anything that you wish to offer to the audience as advice. So I briefly mentioned earlier that when we talked about STEM, we clearly took the approach to say that mindsets needed to be changed for the teachers so that they could inculcate uh, STEM concepts. And I love this analogy that uh, Jyoti Tyagaraj and the founder of Meghshala gave us. She said that on an average, a teacher has 222 days in an academic year uh, to take forward not just the uh, content in the academic year, but they also have additional responsibilities of midday meals, 
or even extracurricular activities. Where does that then leave the teachers time to reskill or upskill themselves? Where do they have the time to engage their thought process in STEM or new developments in science concepts? And that is where the fundamental of the Meghshala app came from. And that is the approach that we like to take to say that capacity building of the teachers in a manner that it does not disturb their teaching um, facilities um, is something that we took as an approach for Meghshala. While that was on capacity building, another element that came to our mind is to say that I'm a generation that grew up in uh, rote learning. How many of us remember any of the science concepts which were taught in the classroom simply because we did not engage in experiential learning? And the Agastya model comes in from there to develop that experiential learning and teaching for them. Then is the issue of saying that um, if you want to build science centers or science labs, do all schools have infrastructure? And that's where the uh, hub and Spock model of uh, Agastya actually works because we work with them on the science center development but also look at the iMobile vans which are linked to the science centers that allows the students who do not have school infrastructure to create a science center model can come to a science center that is affiliated to the iMobiles. The third approach, like I said earlier, is that if you're developing a product that is made in India, do you have the talent to create those products, right? And then there was this perception of saying that you had um, women students in ITI colleges who could not move ahead because they simply didn't have a learning place where they could take their concepts for. That is where came in the birth of um, internships in our Pondicherry plant. And uh, while we initiated that for our Pondicherry plant, a lot of the industries that are in Puducherry are now actually taking advantage of the um, internship program that we've created. And there's a natural talent pool of uh, women engineers from ITI colleges that are being brought into the manufacturing sector. So these are some of the approaches that we have taken over the last three years. And we continue to leverage and build it. Thank you. You brought up teacher training and capacity building, which is a, a difficult thing to achieve, especially given the, the load uh, on our current teachers in the system and uh, the Meghshala app. So that's one area definitely everybody can uh, look up and see how they do it. So just no, nothing, just shifting here and there. So from your, from this side, any, anybody would you like to add? So I think mo model, you know, if gets sort of created or emerges once there is multiple stakeholder who are sitting and the only person probably who gets left behind is that little student or sometimes even a teacher. So what we started doing is created different focus, you know, groups with teachers started getting their inputs. We also invited students, whether they are a part of our program or not. And they started taking some inputs as to what will really work for them in a classroom environment. So I think we started really talking to all of them directly, not just through our partners. Sometimes what happens is they give us, and you know we've worked with all kinds of partners over the last so many years, and they give you something that suits them. But when we talk to the government, it's a different scenario, right? And uh, I've visited so many different rural areas and so many institutions. I think our government has done a brilliant job in terms of the infrastructure set up. There's no need for us to create, well, some of the new age technologies, yes, but some of the infrastructure is underutilized. So we started thinking of using them as skill hub. So that ground research, that sanity check is something I would say that that was the first job of any CSR manager or any organization when they were doing that. Life of a teacher is very hard, agreed. 
but is that the only problem that we have? Perhaps not, right? The same teacher is struggling for a mentor. The same teacher says that, you know, if I send the students or young learners or, you know, job seekers to a workplace and get those workplace experiences, a whole lot of my life will ease out. So it's all interconnected. We are talking the same thing. It's just that those models have to suit A, if you are based out of Karnataka and the leadership team and the CSR team comes together and says, hey, we want to create something for X state, Y state, Maharashtra, whatever it is, uh, or Northeast or Jharkhand, where I think there are 22 aspirational districts. There are, you know, India is vast. The heterogeneity is you know, we don't have to really go that. We all know what it means. So I think that to me, again, I go back to the basics. Designing a plan is the most important thing. To me, that is a great CSR start, start um, starting point, a story that would emerge to really transform you know, first generation learners, their lives forever. So, but the design is the most Im important thing that will match with the policies that have really been crafted by really great thinkers and policy makers. So, implementation partners coming together with corporates, thinking of connecting the dots with the policy makers to create a CSR plan or a design which is unique is something that I always, always think of you know, the minute the year starts off, start reflecting, is this something, do we need a mid-year check, do we really go to do something different or can we con continue this? It's multiple year, multiple stakeholders. So you've got to really be agile and keep thinking. Something that has worked for one a particular teacher or set of school or district or state may not be diff uh, may not be the same for another one. So one has to be very agile. One has to be very connected with the stakeholders on the ground and beneficiaries too. The kids are very smart. Young learners, whether they've gone to school or not, they have innate talent and intelligence. I think we really don't use that. We don't tap and then we keep putting various things on top of that and then they are confused when they come to a workplace scenario. Girls, another last point, girls, I think they get influenced by what others think of them. That's something that kind of also affects a huge deal when they come and when, they, when we see a crisis of women in technology, women in AI, women on cloud, whatever it is, you know, we really see that difference and that starts from this particular you know, little child going and doing something as a science workshop or a hackathon. Thank you, Joyita. So I'm sure there are questions bubbling up uh, uh, to, to all of us, but we let's complete the, and keep that in mind. I'm sure you agree, disagree, have a thought, um, but we are not going to debate it, but uh, we can pose it as a question. So, Vijay. So it's, uh, we're talking about the models, approaches that you found are more, particularly more effective. You want to share. Most of us are NGOs. Right. So, so uh, I'll just you add to up to my panelists a uh, couple of things. I'll just take a step backward and talk about pro the designing of project. When we get projects, we usually anticipate long-term things. STEM is a subject which needs long-term commitment. We are focusing and we are contributing to the well-being of government school students in the rural areas, which needs financial support and monitoring as well. Now, when I talk about project designing, what I mean is, apart from having a long-term commitment or a project, it's also very, very important that we take the monitoring into account. And also, with monitoring, just to mention one more thing, capacity building. Now, when we say about government school teachers, we, the first thing that we assume is they have got n number of other tasks to be performed, other than just teaching, which is true. Just to address that, there should be specialized trainers. And how corporates can help that is obviously by funding that. But a plan wherein we are having trainers, specialized trainers for the STEM-based projects is something that is very, very, very crucial. 
otherwise it's all gets i mean after a certain period of time it's just a infrastructure that gets remained in the schools so that's one thing that should be accounted for thank you vijay seema yeah uh, so what i think is that you know lot of changes has happened because of amendment you know there are a lot of changes in csr amendment so which is which basically defines the period of any csr project so which is also defining uh, i've been helping us to define the approaches for the any csr project which is like 3 plus 1 for the ongoing project so if you ask me before this amendment we were thinking like you know to give everything best you know not thinking much on the sustainability self sustainability part of it but as the amendment has came in place so like you know whenever we design the project we see that how the project becomes self sustained after 4 years or after 3 years so that you know because every time we can't go to the board for the extension or the approval of the project so uh, here the approach is mostly on the public private partnership where we see that the stakeholder involvement is there when we talk about stem it's the uh, institute government institute their involvement uh, is is in in the project and slowly and gradually once we are you know after 3 years the project should become the self sustain so there is a drastic uh, change in approach in csr not only with the stem project but in all our project that we see skilling project also nowadays we have started asking the partners ngo partners that how can we make it sustainable so that you know i can showcase to I, we can go back to the board that okay this is how it has become sustain now we have to go to other school so that's the uh, that's the area where you know when when you submit any proposal please have this uh, aspect so that you know it becomes easy for us to take it to the board thank you so we have just 5 minutes left and i want to ask uh, have sure. the audience ask questions Can I yeah, add yeah. Sure. because in the audience there are many ngos i think i would just like to add uh, on the basis of a challenge uh when you approach the corporates i would request you to do some ground reality check when i work with an ngo i have to do a due diligence i have to be aware of what that organization is doing as ngos you should do that as well when you are approaching a corporate for funding everything is available for you in the public domain the csr policy the annual reports the csr plan all these are amendments that have come into place for you to take advantage as a csr professional i know on a regular basis i receive at least 5 requests uh, per day and my endeavor is always to respond to them within the first 24 hours and there might be only one and sometimes none that appeal to the csr policy that is in place you have the akanksha tool that has been developed by state governments undp is working on tools that allows you to see which are the corporates that are working in the space where you are looking for funding which are the areas that they are looking for funding mca has the reports from corporates all these tools are readily available for you just like we do a due diligence it's time for you to start due diligence for the corporates that you approach believe me you will find a lot more funders who will support you if you do that research yourself thank you pratima for covering that because that is a burning question uh, we all have as to how do we go about it approach which is the best way we had that discussion earlier as well so questions with the audience now but there is a little caveat okay uh, when i ask if i if i ask you to ask the question you'll ask the question first and then yourself and the organization that you represent it is essentially to prevent uh, you know pissing off other people if you speak about your organization a lot uh, it just ends up creating the discord so the question uh, and followed by who you are and which organization you represent and if it is directed the principle i usually use while selecting who's is the straighter the arm the more urgent the question so the gentleman there on the in the blue shirt so <laughs> no you must uh, after after the question yeah share a learning that i recently had from my daughter and then you know again take a view of the panelists on that very very insightful discussion you know my 7 year old daughter recently came to me and said dadu you talk about stem i think it should be steam okay there is a a and i was surprised and amazed she said dadu it's not stem steam and a is arts 
you know i think the reason she brought that point and that really made me think you know i am a engineer working for an ngo you know we never applied integration uh, uh, you know calculus etc and you know always we are told by employers rightfully so that engineers are not creative you know so on that i think uh, george is smiling okay on the other side today i see a lot of convergence in artist you know painting you know where they are actually doing painting you know on using different apps and you know basically what not you know someone is talking about immersive uh, you know painting exhibition where there is a use of lot of technology you know etc so there is no art field today in which there is no application of technology so i think um, uh, you know when my daughter told me it should be steam i was actually thoroughly moved you know because i think uh, there is a lot of convergence today where uh, technology people need to be artist and creative and at the same time rt people need to be equally developed of technology okay so should not you know if if at the level of a 7 year old that thinking is changing should not we also then you know think about steam and not stem you didn't uh, introduce yourself okay my name is gaurav arora i work for salam bombay foundation you know we do a lot of stem thing but i think that's uh, not important yeah thank you so uh, while steam is a thing and there are programs with with a involved and uh, stem the, the fundamental difference is the the application of the formulas and and the foundational knowledge that is required to layer on that is my understanding but from the panel uh, why why stem and not steam for you i think you know i i'd like to say that stem steam whatever acronyms we choose uh the most important thing for me is the mindset which i think one of you already said and to me that is growth mindset and if that child is really telling you all of this she is on the right track in whatever school getting the right inputs from the teachers i think that that is the most important thing that growth mindset not getting label that you are really brilliant or you are not to me those are important aspects of building um up a personality shaping up a personality especially here we are talking about girls and the agency skills and the kind of you know uh, confidence we want to build that so i think that's the most important thing the mindset and especially the growth mindset there are tons of books there are tons of workshops there are tons of tools and resources i think you know a lot of us here with kids with little organizations that you are starting up or you may have started up as a not for profit you know if you really want to get into this there are lots of guidance already the only thing that you need to do is just align with the national priority for and one small example scholarship if an organization like like us we don't want to spend on scholarship that's fine government of india does a lot of scholarship program women in science women in technology can you align with that and create a part make that as a part of your proposal just a small tip all right thank you so i have all these excellent questions i'm not i can't ask my times up but i'm going to ask one question from the the panel before and on behalf of all of you what is the best way for us to get in touch with you your programs how how do you recommend that the audience and the organizations go about it you answered to a great extent the research that you must do align come with a solution to the organization but in terms of practical process is there somebody uh, is it linkedin which is the way uh, how do you prefer that organizations who want to connect with all of you connect because here there is only limited opportunity uh, so that's the question i'm asking on behalf of you okay so okay in my case i think it's linkedin is the easiest like i said 24 hours is what i endeavor to respond to people having said that because we are on the csr box and you've also registered as delegates you would have access to our email ids so please take the opportunity i think uh, there is that app that they sent this morning web mobi or whatever i'm sure you can connect with us on that that would be the easiest way or just connect with csr box and ask them xyz person is who i want to get in touch with i think yes emails will be a, a good way of connecting because we all uh, respond to the emails if you say email you must send the email <laughs> so it is it's very simple seema.suman@skf.com thank you sorry for putting your joyta linkedin i've stopped printing cards some of you have asked me and i really have stopped printing cards so linkedin 
and I am really prompt, but I'll also tell you that if you are not very thoughtful of putting that message, you will not get a reply from me. That's my filter. Yes. So if you really write about the country and the, you know, everything, everything, and then say, you know, this is what it is, I've now got built that mechanism to filter that out. So request you, if you are really sincere, really put it in a few sentences as to what it you want. And I usually respond to everybody, perhaps not in 24 hours, because we really get a lot of questions and proposals, but usually within three days, I get back. LinkedIn, uh, for sure, 12 hours. Uh, but it should be the proposals which I usually seek is, uh, what I usually see is, uh, just how I mentioned, the capacity building component, the training component, and the longevity of the project. It should not be a short-term project. So this is what I look at uh, the proposals. Thanks. Thanks, George. Well, thank you all. Thank you to my panel members. Uh, this has been the number of questions I wanted to ask and direct this. And then nothing ever goes to plan, but it is. I hope you've uh, enjoyed the session and you had some insights as well. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you, George, for being a wonderful moderator. Thank you, George.